I am Mark Weitzman, and this is a session on secondary and university, uh, teaching the Holocaust with secondary and university level um, students. We have a very distinguished panel here. I am not going to introduce them because you have their biographies and their books. I'm just going to point out that first, starting on that side, is Paula Cowan, followed by Christian Kuchler, Ian Jones, Marcy Littell, and James Lamakia. Now, a few. Um, I don't know if I want to call it ground rules, but one of the things that we wanted to do here is structure it a little bit differently than the sessions that we've had before, make this much more informal, much more of a conversation, much more intimate, and especially, most important, have time for questions and answers and participation. So first of all, I'm going to ask and encourage those of you who are in the back to come forward, come as close as, as you can, and I promise you, if you have to leave, if you want to leave, if you feel like leaving, go ahead, no problem. We won't keep you in the tent, but it'll be better if you come up closer and we can have a little bit more of an intimate atmosphere. So if you can move up, that would be helpful. Also, just for, for people, a reminder to turn off cell phones, the usual. I will not turn off this because, as you heard from Michael Berenbaum yesterday, some of us have become so attuned that I don't wear watches anymore, so this will be my timekeeper but the sound is turned off. Um, other than that, as soon as everyone comes up, I think we're pretty much ready to start. Um, and I'll be sitting down and we'll begin our conversation in about 30 seconds. Okay, can everybody hear? Okay, excellent. So, to begin the conversation, because as we've heard many times already this morning, yesterday, day before, on the one hand, we're all professionals when it comes to dealing with the subject. On the other hand, this is a subject, a topic that you invest yourself personally, totally in, immersed into the subject. So my first question is going to be a very simple one, and it'll be addressed to the panel at large. Everyone, perhaps Ian will begin with uh, answering it. But the question is, why, simply, why do you teach the Holocaust? What was your choice that brought you there? What are the things that you hope to get out of it? Why are you so invested in this subject? So, Ian? Thank you, Mark. Uh, it will be a anecdotal in style. Um, I'll explain to you my experience as a principal of a high school in Ontario, Canada. Uh, my school is 1,250 students in a community just west of Toronto the fastest growing community in all of Canada. So that sets the context a little bit. Why I would teach the Shoah? Well, very simply this. Um, about five years ago, I took a group of students to Auschwitz. And uh, being in a small community, we ended up on the front page of the paper. And I went to the barber. I know some of you might find that rather unnecessary, but I went to the barber. And I've known Steve, my barber, practically all my life. And so Steve's cutting my hair, and he said, oh, I saw in the paper you went someplace with the kids from the school. And I said, yes, I took them to Auschwitz. And Steve said, yeah, what's that? And I thought, you can't be serious. But he was. He had not ever heard of Auschwitz. Uh, and so what do you tell your barber while you're in the middle of a haircut? Uh, but I realized that there were many people in my community for whom the Holocaust was... Um, breakfast conversation. They'd never heard about it. Uh, even though it's um, something that's taught on the Ontario curriculum, it hasn't always been that way. And so in the last five years, I decided one of the key goals, one of the main objectives that I wanted to set for my school goal was to make sure that if you ask any of the kids in my school now, what's the Shoah, I'm pretty confident that they would give a, a fairly lucid answer. So. Simple reason, but pretty profound. That's what got me started doing it. Marcy, perhaps you? I'm the daughter of Russian immigrants uh, who uh, came to America before World War II. Uh, during, after World War II, members of my family uh, accepted people from displaced persons camps through the highest program. And that, I was a little girl, and that was my first exposure to survivors. 
and my relationship with them while they lived with members of my family, of course, got buried in the computer of my mind. And when I became a history teacher, my fields are social studies, social history, and education, uh, and I was first organizing my classes, I couldn't find anything in the textbook about the Holocaust. And of course, this sent me on a quest that began in the 1960s, and here I am, <laughs> with this desire and, and understanding of the importance, not just to teach a subject, not just to teach to the exams as they now do in most of the Amer American schools for assessment, but to create a person with a heart to feel and the mind and capacity for intellectual reasoning and to connect the two. And that became my goal, the teaching of the whole person, not only intellectually, but socially and as a human being to create human beings as well. That's why I'm here. Uh, James? Uh, well, I come at this from probably two uh, different vectors. Uh, the first is, uh, in, I was a junior in high school in 1968, I probably just dated myself. And uh, my English teacher uh, showed us a film called Night and Fog. And um, I found that a, a completely shattering uh, experience, a truly shattering experience. I was a student at a Catholic high school, so I was therefore a uh, Catholic. And those were the days when, if you were a Catholic, you were, it was presumed you were a practicing Catholic. Um, and it, it had a huge uh, impact on my faith journey. I completely lost my faith uh, as a result of that. Um, so I became kind of personally preoccupied with the Shoah uh, as early as my junior year in high school. And it was always, when it wasn't in the front of my mind as, a, as an issue, it was always in the back of my mind. I did ultimately reconcile the faith uh, dimension of the issue because I, I'm now an Episcopal priest. Um, but uh, it was a long, hard uh, struggle. The, I came to teach the Holocaust because, um, uh, like uh, my colleague, I discovered among my students that they knew almost nothing about it. And this was, I thought, especially appalling because um, I teach in a uh, boarding school for grades 9 through 12 outside of Boston. Uh, so these are uh, highly motivated, very bright uh, kids, most of whom have gone to uh, private schools uh, since kindergarten. So they came through a very, very good educational system. And uh, one day I was uh, teaching a class, and I, I don't even remember why, but somehow the issue of the Holocaust came up in the class. And uh, having taught for 32 years, y you know when you get that look on a student's face that they have absolutely no idea whatsoever what you're talking about. So I was a little taken aback by that and I paused and I started to question them, well, what is the Holocaust and uh, when did it take place? And the, uh, there were 12 kids in the class and among the 12 kids, the only thing that they really knew was A, that it was something that had happened to do the Jews, uh, B, that it took place during uh, World War II, and C, it was awful. And that was the extent of their knowledge. When I then went to the, the history department, I teach in the religious studies department, when I went to the history department and looked at their curriculum, I noticed that um, the Holocaust was only covered in two classes in the required American history course. So it was at that point, and perhaps because it had been so personally important to me, that I decided I have got to teach the Holocaust. So, so I Thank came you. to it. Uh, Paula? Um, okay, can, can you hear me? Um, I know that I speak English, but some people sometimes comment that Scottish accent is a very strange accent. So I will try my best and speak a little bit slower. Um, can I say that in Scotland, people my generation and older than me, and I would say up to probably about 20 years younger than me, never learned about the Holocaust. 
When I was 14 years of age, um, a girl came up to me at school and said to me, Paula, is this true? And she had looked at her history textbook, and in the history textbook there were two black and white photographs of the Holocaust. You'll know the images well. They were well-known camp images. Um, I have to tell you, I, I was hardly an expert in Holocaust education myself at the age of 14. Um, but I had watched a couple of documentaries, um, and I said, well, yes, of course it's true. But what really hit me about that incident was, why did she come up to me to ask me? I wasn't particularly a bright student. I can tell you that now. I was incredibly mediocre. Why was she asking me? Well, you probably worked it out. She was making that assumption that because I was Jewish, I would know the answer. And that, that, that didn't ring well with me. Why should it be because I'm Jewish? I know about the Holocaust. It's the Holocaust just for, for Jewish people. And, and I think that's one of the reasons um, why I've been very, very consciously helping to develop Holocaust and Holocaust education in Scotland. Um, Ian talked about um, polls, about people not knowing about, in, um, talking about, um, not knowing about what, what Auschwitz was. There was a media poll, um, sadly, only a few years ago. I think it was 2000 and maybe 2008, 2009 in Scotland. And they managed to find a lot of young people in Scotland who did not know who Adolf Hitler was. So that's pretty frightening. So that's, that's one of the reasons why. Um, why I am involved in Holocaust educational research is a kind of a different kind of a, a question though. Um, when I was wor working out what I was going to study for my masters, I was actually going to be doing music because I'm actually quite musical. And um, I just thought about writing a, a very draft dummy plan on Holocaust education just to see what a tutor's reaction would be. I was kind of testing it. And I wrote this, this, this plan out and I submitted it to the tutor. And uh, I can just tell you, this tutor is now a very eminent professor scholarly in the universities in Scotland. And this is not somebody who's a, you know, a, a, a very sort of small-minded person. It's somebody who's very, very in instrumental, very influential, influential rather. She turned around to me and she said, hmm, why? And it wasn't um, why as in, well, that's interesting, why? It was why as in, why bother with that? And it was at that very moment that my thinking changed um, and, I, and, I, and I decided I was going to you know, work in that area. I think today, why teaching the Holocaust though, is quite a different society from my time in Scotland when I was 14. We've all moved on. And I think that today um, we have a lot of other pressures out there for young people and a lot of other messages out there for young people which they are plastered with on social networking sites and on the internet and with a lot of hate language. And I do think that if they don't know what the Holocaust is, if they have that ignorance and they still don't know what Auschwitz is or what Adolf Hitler, who Adolf Hitler is, we have a real problem a real problem, and that is why I think ultimately we have to teach the Holocaust. Thank you, Christian. Before, answer, before, before answering the question, I wanted to do some small remark. I'm not really used to speak English anymore over the last few years, therefore I have to beg your pardon for all the mistakes in grammar and, and vocabulary and so on. But referring to your question, why I'm teaching the Holocaust, first, I had to do it. I've been a normal teacher at a gymnasium, a high school in Germany, and I had a really large impression about that, uh, not only because I really, I've always been really interested in that item, but also I saw that the pupils are really interested in that item. And uh, changing to the university level, now I'm teaching didactics uh, of history and of politics in Aachen, and I could do everything. I could. Um, intensify teaching about the Roman Empire or the Middle Ages or something like that, but uh, my own uh, point is to teach the Holocaust and to teach everything which happened after that. And first of all, I do this because I think um, upcoming teachers in Germany have to know about it. This is the main and this is the center issue. German history is always or is still dealing with it. and. Um, I have the impression they are really interested in it, but uh, okay. <laughs> okay.
Mark instructed us that this was to be informal, this opening question, and so I was remiss. I should add that um, when I decided to seek uh, help from the uh, authorities, the professors in my department, first I went to my history department. Not one professor at that time in the 60s in the history department at Temple University, of course, had any background or interest in the Holocaust. And next I went to the most distinguished social studies professor who was nationally recognized and told him what I really was interested in doing uh, even for my doctoral work and he looked at me and he said Marcy don't you know what the Holocaust is and I looked at him and I said well that's why I want to do research and find out he said no and this is really very offensive but it, it is a, an indication of the kind of cultural anti-semitism that existed at that time hopefully it still doesn't and he said the Holocaust is just a way that federations get money from rich Jews and I looked at him in amazement and said well I guess we aren't going to be working together, are we? And was really very, very discouraged. And another member of my department said, there is a man in the religion department who was very interested in writing about the Holocaust and had taught the first seminar in the United States, a graduate seminar on the uh, German church struggle in the Holocaust. Why don't you go and talk with him? and his name was Franklin Littell, and um, he took a very special interest in my work. Uh, I lost a good member of a dissertation committee, but the rest is history. <laughs> I want to follow up on uh, what, what Christian a little bit, but certainly what Marcy and James just said. If um, we talk about the Holocaust, and we talk about its student reception stu uh, with students, but they just brought up another interesting aspect, which we had not necessarily planned on, but I think it would be worth exploring, which is what is the reception amongst your peers, amongst your teachers, the teachers that you studied with, amongst your peers in departments? James, you mentioned you went from religion to history looking for something. Marcy, you just told us about your reaction. When you try to introduce the topic into your teaching as a topic of concern, of, of, of interest, the subject matter, how, what is the reception? And has it changed over the years? Was there initially antagonism? Or was it open arms? How do you find it today? If uh, we'll start with, um, well, I don't know if you have anything to add to that, James, let's say, and then we'll go around and see. Well, I think uh, initially uh, it was thought of as being exotic. Um, the history department was clearly not interested in it. They were, the department at my school tends to be uh, very centered on American history. Um, and uh, they're, of course, interested in the Second World War, but not in focusing on this in any way. Um, but I think what convinced the school that we might have a whole course is that genocide is becoming a more important issue. And because of that, um, it was possible to convince the school that well, in some ways, this was the paradigmatic genocide. So if you're going to be uh, interested in raising student awareness about genocide, then you really have to start with the Shoah. And, and, and we have uh, the freedom to create our own uh, elective courses, so uh, there was no, no problem in doing that. Uh, Ian? The, um the situation in my community uh, is such that it gave me the impetus that I needed to get my staff involved. The change in our community has been so profound in one generation of students. If I just give you a quick example of that, uh, Anne, my wife and I are blessed to have um, six kids. That's partly the reason why I don't go to the barber anymore. Um, but we have two sets of twins, and our second set of twins are adopted, and they're black. And uh, when they were in grade school where we live, they were the visible minority in the school. 500 kids in that grade school, visible minority, two black kids. By the time they got to the high school, where I was the principal, maybe not the most popular situation, have your dad as the principal, but they did fine. The school had changed so that we were almost half and half visible minority. So in one cohort of students, that change had taken place. And so I, I 
gathered the staff and said, we don't need to be too perceptive to see that we need to predict and prevent rather than respond and react. We can predict that this is going to bring stress on our community. We don't need to be psychologists and psychiatrists to do that. And we should put something in place to prevent as much as we can rather than respond and react when things don't go the way we thought they would. And so we settled on a very simple but not simplistic phrase. And the phrase is, when difference leads to hate, it's wrong. You can teach that to children in kindergarten. You can teach it to fifth grade, twelfth grade, university, old guys like me. When difference leads to hate, it's wrong. And the vehicle that we use to do that is the Holocaust. It's so accessible, it's easy for people to get information about it. We can incorporate it into so many different disciplines within the school. I have teachers in my school in the foods course that do uh, a part of the foods course. And you think, well, f how do you get the Holocaust in the foods course? And uh, there's a fabulous book you'll be able to find online by Mina Pachter. It's called In Memory's Kitchen. It's the story of a woman who went to Terezin, an older woman in Theresienstadt, and she gathered recipes in the evenings from the women that gathered around her in, in the ghetto, and she wrote them down. She didn't survive, but regrettably, but fortunately, her book did survive. Through a whole series of strange and weird circumstances, the book ended up with her granddaughter in the United States, and it's published. You can buy it on Amazon, in Memory's Kitchen. So my foods teacher found it. So the, the, the summative work that the kids in grade 11 foods course do is they have to find a recipe that they chose from In Memory's Kitchen, and that's their summative project. They cook the recipe from In Memory's Kitchen. So we've tried to incorporate in as many different ways we can in as many different disciplines. And to get my staff on fire to be able to do that, um, I think that gives us some idea of why we try to do it. We've talked a little bit about the reception among peers, but you've also talked about the one of the motivating factors was the level of ignorance about amongst the community and as well as students. So the, my next question is, and perhaps Christian, you'll start with this, is what level of knowledge and understanding of the Shoah do the students have when they enter your classroom, and what do you aspire for them to have when they leave? Well, um, first of all, I think, as, I, as I've already said, that the pupils are really interested in this uh, topic because it's a, perhaps a German topic uh, or an essential topic for German history. But they do, however, not consider that is the only uh, point which has to be considered. If I ask my pupils sometimes um, how they would judge their own knowledge about the Third Reich, previously, before teaching or after the teaching lessons, um, they frequently used to answer we know everything about Hitler and we know everything about the Second World War. Um, this statement made me think about it and um, it makes obvious in my eyes that the Holocaust is not the primary thing they are talking about. And this is something you, which really changed. Uh, in addition to that, you uh, talked about, I think that if I would have been asked that 20 years ago, 25 years ago, I would have answered, I know everything about Hitler and I know everything about the Holocaust, not about the Second World War. Um, if this is right, that the pupils do know everything about the Holocaust or everything about Hitler, I'm quite sure that we all agree that this is not right, but this is the impression my pupils answered. Um, among the history students, I think, um, and I only can speak about the history students who want to get teachers afterwards, um, there is really big interest in that topic, but there are only less things where they could join seminars in and they could uh, get information about the Third Reich. Um, most of the things where students and pupils get the information how they think that they know everything about Hitler is related to movies, is related to cinema documentaries and something like that, to the media as a whole, internet as well. Um, and against this background, university teach teaching should be about a science-based examination of the Holocaust, as we heard over the last few days. Um, 
even more, in my eyes, even more for upcoming teachers. They should recognize that the HOA, the, sorry, the Shoah can only be taught approximately if the victims' voices are included to the analyze. If you look to German uh, textbooks in the history uh, lessons, there are mostly uh, sources from the perpetrators, still. We had an uh, analyze of that. We had about 60 uh, sources from the perpetrators and only 18 or 20 from the, uh, from the victims. And my aim is to give a multi-perspective view on that history and on the Holocaust. That there were not only the perpetrators, uh, there were not only the victims, and you have to try to get in touch with them. Well, if you take a really, really big issue, then you could uh, try to make it as a contribution to Saul, uh, Saul Friedlander's integ integrated history. To talk about history, and they should know about most of the people who were involved in this process, and this is my uh, aim I want to reach. Thank you. Marcy? I'll try to be brief so we can get to some questions from the audience. Um, I'm very uh, fortunate in teaching at the Richard Stockton College of New Jersey. In the state of New Jersey, the Holocaust uh, and genocide is mandated K through 12 with funding which means the teachers in our state also receive funding from the state for workshops and for f additional study. That makes a big difference when uh, it is a funded mandate. And so um, everyone has had, uh, comes into our college has some background, some understanding at very different levels. Some have only read Anne Frank, some have had really uh, very fine introductions. But our undergraduate program is unique in that we, at this school, we teach five undergraduate sections every semester on the Holocaust and genocide. Um, I teach in the graduate program. And, uh, as, and I also teach, <coughs> excuse me, in the undergraduate senior seminar. So they do have background when they come to uh, me, and but we get other students from outside of New Jersey as well, of course, in the graduate program, many teachers, professionals, doctors, lawyers, social workers, librarians, but all have some substantive background. And what I really try to delve into uh, in the seminars is to get them to see a broader perspective, to see it in a different light, through a different view, and understand the critical way of looking at material and information. Of course, you always, I always provide the, the, the through lines, but to ask questions of substance. That's really important. And when someone says to me at the end of the graduate seminar, you know, you've really helped me see what I thought I knew in a very different way, then I think maybe I've done a little something good in teaching. Yeah. Before we turn to Paula for something else about this, we did not forget about the question part for the participation yeah. part, but to keep the conversation flowing up here, I'd like to hold the questions until, let's say, the last half hour or so, so you can make notes of things that you want to come back to and ask and refer to uh, would probably be the best way of doing that, and then we'll come back and open it up for your participation a little bit later on in, in, the, in the session. Uh, Paula? Um, the question. Um, the question was, what do you want? Um, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> the, the question was the level of knowledge that no, your no, students no. have coming in and what you aspire yeah. okay. or hope. That, as teachers, we always hope to, to leave them with something, to get them to some plateau. Yeah. So no, where I, I was listening to, to Marcy, because I think Marcy made a, good, a very imp important point, which is that a lot of it will depend on prior knowledge um, of students. And I think that we have, we have students um, coming into high school or secondary school in, in, in the United Kingdom who have actually learned it, learned something. And it might have been through the story of Anne Frank, which I know was mentioned a few days ago uh, by Professor Burr, but they might have learned something about the Holocaust in their primary school, and they'll be bringing that knowledge, that subject knowledge, to their understanding in, in high school. Um, and I think that there may be other young people coming into the secondary school system whose, um, whose knowledge of the Holocaust is very much reliant on uh, literature they've read, films they've seen, uh, might be websites they've seen on, on, on the internet. And I think that's a little bit more what I would call dodgy, because I think that then you're more likely to have students coming into high school who have some inaccurate misconceptions of what, of what the Holocaust is. And I think we've got to make sure that we address that in the, in the high school. 
Um, as to what we're going to, um, te what, what level we want them to, uh, to leave with, I think at the very least, we want them to know who the key people are in the Holocaust, who the victims were, who the perpetrators were, who the collaborators were, who the bystanders, all of the role of the bystanders too, um, as well as the uplifting stories of the righteous amongst the, 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 the nations. I think they ought to know the, the geographical, important geographical um, points of information, important dates of information, so they see the whole thing in the historical context of World War II. That might seem obvious to you, but I can tell you, in, in, in Britain, it's not obvious. Yeah, many people have studied history and passed wonderful exams in history, in fact, even in World War II in the school system, and have not actually learned very much about the Holocaust. So I think we, we have to make sure that that too um, is, is put into the, the correct context. And I think we have to understand that, or the students have to understand, that the Holocaust wasn't an event, it was a process, and all the different elements in that, that process. So I would say that a lot of students in the secondary school, in contrast to what, what Christian said, which is that they know all about it. They think they, they, know. Think they know all about it, okay. They think they know all about it. I would actually say that my experience talking to, to teachers in high schools is that sometimes, and this is what we've got to avoid, I think, as teachers, is that they don't leave school thinking, I know all I want to know about it. I think, I think that's a real, a real challenge for us as educators. Um, so what happens at the end of, of high school when they come to the university or, or higher education? Um, I've got very limited experience of this because I've only very recently dipped into um, undergraduate teaching. Um, but I will say that um, when, I, when I take my, my small cohort who are learning um, a module Holocaust Studies and Citizenship, which I'll say is in partnership with Yad Vashem, and I do the overview of what I'm doing in this module so that they all understand it, um, they always say to me, at the end of it, they say to me, Paula, they say to me, you, th th there's too many things about the Jewish people in this, Paula. And I said, what do you mean? They said, well, when we learned about it in our, in our school, we were interested in it. You know, we were told the victims were, and they identify all the victims. And I'm going, well, yeah, but what about the, the particular genocide of the Jews? And I think, well, something's happened there, that they know about it, they're coming with their prior knowledge, but they have this, this, this lack of understanding. And of course, I don't answer the question. I say, well, wait till the end of the module. I'll ask you that question. See if you can answer it for me. Um, so I think that you know, these are some of the points that, that, should, that are important to consider. Thanks, Paula. Um, we've had university level responses to this, but I'd like to ask James to respond in terms of uh, secondary school on this. Well, my situation is perhaps somewhat anomalous in that I have a whole semester um, so we really begin at the beginning. I, I start the course with um, uh, The Longest Hatred, uh, Robert Wistrich's uh, uh, video about uh, the history of anti-Semitism. And then we move on to Weimar Germany, uh, Nazi racial uh, ideology, um, uh, the political situation that brought Hitler to power, um, and then right through to uh, 1945. So by the end of the course, they, they have really had a complete history of both the events of the Holocaust um, and also of uh, the roots of the Holocaust uh, as well. But I, I think that um, uh, the chief rabbi on Monday night made uh, what I thought was a very interesting and important uh, point. And, and I, in terms of my hope of what students come out with, um, he drew the distinction between what did happen and how could it happen. I'm very confident that by the end of the semester, they have a very complete and full knowledge of what did happen. I hope that throughout this process, the semester-long process, that they get at least some perspective, certainly no answer, but some perspective on how could it uh, have happened? And I think that that does happen over the course uh, of the semester. Um, I have them do a final reflection paper uh, in which they talk about 
uh, what do they do with all of this knowledge that they have? And it's clear that really every one of them to a person uh, has, has been changed by the experience. And it's very interesting, the class itself becomes kind of a community having gone through this semester-long experience together. Um, when This is taught in the fall, and when the students and I pass each other in the halls, uh, we look at each other in, in, a, in a way that doesn't ordinarily happen. It's a kind of knowing look of, uh, we've been through something together. It's so. great, great to hear about. Students view things differently. Uh, what is the way that you approach it to fit in, or do you approach it as something outside of the national narrative, so to speak? So perhaps, Ian, if you'd like to begin with that. Uh, Canada is a surprising place for many reasons. Um, many people would not recognize the connection that Canada would have to the Shoah. Um, North American Indians who were removed from their homes and placed in residential schools uh, were forced to speak English and not their native language. They were punished if they spoke Cree or Ojibwe. Their clothing was burned. Uh, they tattooed numbers on children's arms. Um, I've heard that, uh, that that's where the Nazis got the idea of tattooing numbers on kids' arms. I don't know whether that's true or not, but it certainly happened in Canada. Um, the St. Louis, we all know the story of the St. Louis. What many people don't know in that was that after the St. Louis had been turned away from Miami, uh, communication was made to the Canadian government to see if the St. Louis could come to Canada. The answer was no. A uh, very infamous quote from one of the members of the Mackenzie King government when asked how many Jews could come to Canada, his answer was, none is too many. Lots of people in Canada don't know that. They don't like to find out that us very friendly, middle-of-the-road Canadians could say such things. And so the Canadian narrative has a lot to do with the Shoah. And once people have a chance to see some of those things and discover that it's too easy to sit in judgment of someone else when, in fact, we could turn that lens back on ourselves, it's a very powerful thing to be able to do in the Canadian narrative. It's not something that you could create an entire course out of, but there are things like that that are part of uh, what happened in Canada. Canada is one of the very few places in the world where you can use a superior order's defense against a war crime. Uh, it happened in Canada in the 60s. Nazi war criminal found, prosecuted, went to the Supreme Court of Canada. His defense was, I was ordered to do this, and the Supreme Court upheld that defense. And so now there's very limited effort spent in trying to track down war criminals in Canada because that precedent is in Canadian law. Uh, those sort of things ring with a very bad taste in your mouth in Canada, and, and it connects directly to that narrative. So uh, and it goes back to what Professor Bauer was saying. Nobody comes clean in this. Even countries that are far away from what actually happened, nobody comes clean. Marcy? Well, it's clear there's certainly enough guilt to go around everywhere. Mm. And for those who may have been in Raphael Medoff's uh, session yesterday, uh, the United States as well uh, remained silent and could have helped more. I mean, there is plenty of guilt. But one of the things that we really adhere to very, uh, very, very clearly is the core. And not comparing, it's, it's a delicate balance, while not comparing with other tragedies and other genocides, beginning with the Shoah as the core. I just want to give you a very brief example. Uh, as director of the MA program, the founding director, I had a young woman who was a survivor of the Rwanda genocide. She called me, she wanted to come into the MA program. She had just completed her undergraduate work. So I asked her, uh, what interests you? I asked that of all the students. Why do you want to come into this program? And she said, well, I want to teach my people and I want to teach others about the Rwandan genocide, but first, I have to understand the Shoah. And I thought, she gets it. 
And, and I think that's a very delicate balance that we work with. Um, also, I think you all of you are teaching admirable courses in your various countries. We, I think it's important to begin with uh, anti-Semitism and understanding of it and life Jewish life and culture before the Holocaust, because we, we have predominantly non-Jewish students in our uh, program, 99% are non-Jewish students from a very different socioeconomic class than you have in boarding school. All of them are first, uh, first time graduates, college graduates in their families primarily. And um, it's, it's just um, very important for them to understand these principles and, and not compare and, and to understand these essentials that all Jews were not victims before the Holocaust, the beauty and the culture that was lost. And yet it is separate from the Jewish Studies Department. Uh, Holocaust Studies is not Jewish Studies. We have a separate division of Jewish Studies, but they have to have some fundamental background. James, you want to add anything from an American perspective briefly? Uh, well, actually, I think our kids come in very uh, receptive to understanding uh, the Holocaust as a genocide and as the formative uh, genocide because something is going on in the grammar schools in social studies education where almost every student just comes in with the presumption that a genocide had already taken place in the United States, and that concerned the uh, North American, uh, the Native Americans. So they're already attuned to the idea of not only do genocides happen, but a genocide happened right here. And they speak about it very um, uh, comfortably, that, that this is not a new or a shocking idea to them, the idea of we ourselves committed genocide in this country seems to be a common understanding. Uh, Paul, of the Scottish perspective? Historical narrative, yeah, I, the, there is, um, there's researchers have said, Gundari, I don't know if I'm pronouncing their names right, Gundari and Batalan said um, that uh, they, they, they claim that the nature of Holocaust education is partly dependent on each country's involvement in World War II and in each country's um, history of anti-Semitism. Um, that t taking the last one first, um, in Scotland, we don't really have an official record of anti-Semitism in Scotland. Um, and I think that anti-Semitic um, incidents in Scotland are pretty isolated. But we do have other prejudices. We do have uh, sectarianism, which is a very, very large problem and one that's being addressed by the current Scottish government. And Holocaust education and learning about Holocaust is seen as, um, as helpful. In, in addressing uh, sectarianism. What about our history of World War II? That's different. Uh, and in fact, you, you could say in some ways in the United Kingdom that could be one reason why the Holocaust took so long to, to be taught in schools because our history in the United Kingdom, uh, as far as World War II is concerned, has a strong focus on the home front, on the Battle of Britain, on the Allied forces, etc., etc. And the Holocaust narrative um, has only recently been added to, to that. But I think it's also a question of, um, in good teaching, good pedagogy is always making things relevant to, to, to your learners. And in Scotland, um, th there are also many historical links with, with the Holocaust. There are kinder transport refugees who came to Scotland. There were refugees on the run who came to lived and lived in Scotland. There were camp survivors after the war who also came to Scotland. We also had a, a, a one very significant prisoner of war camp um, up north in Scotland. And there is one righteous amongst the nation. There's one called Jane Haining who, uh, who helped save uh, children in, in Buda, from Budapest. So we do have, it's part, if you like, of our own identity and our own Scottish history. And I'm saying that, I suppose, at a time when Scotland's at a very, I suppose, significant and important point in its history. And now that it has a devolved government, as you may, some of you may know, there's a lot of talk about it beca becoming independent. And, and a lot of politicians in Scotland see it as their time to be independent. So that historical narrative is actually very, very important. Um, and I think it's, I do think it has important to each and every one of us in this room. And, and Christian? 
Well, uh, national narrative, you said Canada is far away. It's not possible to say Germany was far away. <laughs> Therefore, it's a essential thing to talk about. Um, I think it is really necessary in Germany, the pupils and the students, to talk about the, 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 the changes in this narrative. Um, if we talk about the um, dealing with the Holocaust after 1945 in Germany, you have lots of breaks in this. You have the 60s, no one talked about it, no one was really interested, or mostly mo uh, the people were not interested. Um, then afterwards it changed during the 60s, then it had to be an American uh, TV series, Holocaust, to wake the people up. Um, and to make them interested in those things. And even, um, especially the pupils in my eyes and in my experience, it's been really interesting for the pupils that uh, in the early 80s, late 70s, the first local initiatives took part. Who, what did happen in my town? What did happen in any small community? This was not discussed during the 1950s and it had been discussed, uh, initiated by a uh, pupils history um, contest um, dem, the Geschichtswettbewerb uh, of the German Bundespräsident who really uh, started a campaign dealing with this local things and afterwards it became a, a common thing someone yesterday mentioned and talked about uh, mainstream to deal with that Holocaust and I think it is as necessary uh, to talk about that thing how to deal with the Holocaust after the Holocaust is as necessary to deal with pupils and especially to deal with, with at, a, at a university level as it is necessary to deal with the, the facts, the history. Um, the remembrance of it is quite different and my opinion, if I look at my students, is they really think that it had always been in the way it is now. That there are lots of uh, memorial sites, that there, there are lots of films, that there are lots of other things we always talked about. And this is not uh, the case, and therefore it is an important impression in my eyes to, to talk about that and to teach about that. You had... Uh, okay, we'll see. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you're absolutely right. We have now, very fortunately, an abundance of materials and films and an outpouring, and it wasn't that way at first when we began. Um, and, and the responsibility now is to keep the core focused and not to allow sweeping generalizations. Maybe it's my uh, uh, acute patriotism to America because I'm an immigrant's daughter, but I, I feel very uncomfortable when students says, well, America committed genocide without making uh, distinctions. Uh, you know, we, we, engage, we talk about the Japanese-American ev uh, evacuation and other atrocities with, with the Indians and define what genocide is, but being very specific, I think it's is important. And also the, uh, and, and part of that, making distinctions, is to understand that everything was not just in Germany and in Poland. That the, the entire picture in which the Holocaust was involved, and that really opens them up to seeing the spread of guilt throughout Europe and everywhere else. Uh, but it's that carefulness and making intelligent distinctions that I, I find is very important with students. Uh, uh, Ian, if you want a brief comment. Uh, Marcus, since you were going to uh, ask a different question, can I go back to something for just a second? Sure. To pick something up. Um, I'd like to just go back to something that Paula said um, concerning what we expect the students to be able to come away with when we finished. And uh, I think she made a terrific point when she said that they, they to come away with the understanding that they don't know everything about this, uh, that there is something planted in them that wants to continue the study in some way. The reason I think that's so critically important is that in a public high school setting, such as the school where I'm the principal, the Holocaust will be taught one period, perhaps, in the year. I don't have the luxury that, if luxury is the right word, that James has, for a, a teacher to teach an entire course on the Shoah. There are no schools that I know of, certainly none in my district, where there is an entire course on the Holocaust. The Holocaust will be taught as part of the unit on the Second World War. And based on the interest of the teacher, it may be a 15-minute discussion. It may be a three-day unit. 
In my school, it's more, but in schools in my district, it's much less. So a lot of the conversation that we've heard in the days of this conference is from people who spend their entire academic professional life dealing with the Holocaust. Professor Bauer doesn't talk much about the ecology of the world. He talks about the Holocaust. Um, the people on the panel, that's what they do. But in my school, it's not what all my teachers do. People that teach mathematics never talk about the Shoah. Even people that are involved in the, um, in, in the history, only a very small portion. So my, my biggest hope is that they'll get what Paula said. They'll get enough of a seed planted that they'll want to say, there's got to be more to this. There's got to be a bigger story here somewhere. There's got to be something beyond what I've just learned. And hopefully one day end up in Marcy's school hopefully. getting even more knowledge about it. But I don't know if that resonates with many of you people in the audience. If you're in that situation where you're saying, okay, all well and good, but we really only talk about the Holocaust for this much time or we won't finish the curriculum and then there'll be problems. Marcy, very I, briefly. I wish we could get more administrators in. I mean, well, that's the one piece. Everything is a process. But getting the administrators on board is really an important piece. And you're a perfect example of that. Oh, thank you, Marcy. <laughs> the, other, the other issue is that we, when we began the work early on, uh, we were taught that by Professor Littell, Franklin Littell, that all work that we enter on the Holocaust should have three eyes. It should be interfaith always. It should be interdisciplinary. The mathematicians and the, the art teachers and the music teachers all need to be involved. And it should be international as well. And I think that they're important keys to keeping the work That's throughout. Great. And then if we had admin, we could clone you, we'd really have a good case in the American Thank schools. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to follow up with a question that will sound a little bit as if it's coming from left field because it struck me as I was listening to you, um, not you particularly, but the panel, that in, the, in answering the last question, many of us often grew up in, in this field with Hilberg's famous paradigm of perpetrators, uh, bystanders, and victims. So let's hopefully leave aside the perpetrator category in this case. But I am curious whether your students generally see or empathize with one of the other two characters, uh, characterizations, whether they are, feel drawn or closer to the bystanders or if they can really empathize with the perspective of the victims. And do you have a preference which ones they should do and how do you get and reach that point? So James, I'm going to start you off with that one. Well, uh, in the course we read uh, Christopher Browning's uh, book, um, Ordinary. Uh, about ordinary the uh, men. ordinary, ordinary men. men. Um, and so that really raises the whole uh, issue. And um, the students really have to wrestle with that whole, not just wrestle with the paradigm, but try to find themselves in the paradigm. And uh, then uh, we follow that up with reading uh, Primo Levi's uh, essay from the, uh, the Drowned and the Saved right. about the murkiness of the uh, of the categories. And uh, I think that that's very, very fruitful because the students um, have to face the fact that if they were in that situation themselves, given what they have just read in both of those works, it's not easy to answer the question of where would I have found myself. At the very end of the course, I show the, uh, the film The Reader um, which really raises this whole issue. And uh, that, that scene where uh, she's in the courtroom and she asks the judge, what would you have done? And there's absolute mm -hmm. silence. Uh, the students find themselves in that silence. They do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Christian, do you? Um, I think oh, the, the problem is that um, in my eyes, if we talk about, do you understand? Um, I try again. One, two, three. Nothing. Okay. Okay. 
Uh, you know what, Marcy will go okay. in the meantime, and then we'll come I, I back hope, to Christian. I, I hope that my colleague is going to refer to the reader, but I think it also tells us a lot about the okay. second and third generation of German students with whom I, I've had a good deal of contact. And, and the uh, effect it has on them. You know, we're dealing now, the people, as we are losing our survivors more and more, those who will be carrying on the work are going to be the third and the fourth generation. Um, uh, and, and we're losing our survivors. That, the survivors are part of the whole, uh, part of the teaching process. How do you feel about that in relation to the reader and its indication or representation of the third and fourth generation of German, young Germans? Christian. I have to admit that I only heard the last yeah. few words okay. and uh, I, I... Do you like it? No, we can't hear. You can't hear? I can't hear. It is really hard to understand hard. what can't you're talking here. Uh, uh, all right, so do, we'll have to do our best. Then. Yeah. Just, um, um, we apologize for the technical difficulties. <laughs> I thought there would be tech, no, no, uh, grammatical or, or linguistical problems, but um, <laughs> now there are also some technical problems. But um, the question, as I remember, is that uh, if, the, if the, the pupils or the students are interested in the perpetrators or in the victims or the bystanders, I think, um, or in my remembrance as working as a teacher, uh, I had been sometimes really shocked about uh, the, the situations that the pupils were really impressed about the things the perpetrators did. The high technical standard, the, how it worked. But on the other side, I have been impressed uh, that they have been shocked at the same moment about the things they did. I think that is a, a, a paradox, but um, from that point, there is the danger that there is too much interest in the perpetrators. I think this is a really gr great danger, even at the memorial sites, that they are too much interested in the, the, the things which happened there and they do not look at the victims. They do not even look at the bystanders. Um, but on the other hand, I think this is also a chance to deal that history as a story of human beings and to look at, at single persons, to look at the, 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 the sources which are left or which are common for the, for the human beings who suffered and the human beings who survived. And therefore, it has to be, uh, as I've already said, multi-perspective thing to deal with and it cannot be only the, the, the first impression for the pupils who were, in my eyes, too much interested only in the perpetrators in Germany. I have no idea if whether right. there is no, a very, German very thing, but my impression is that. Okay. All right, I want to ask also, um, a sort of an outgrowth of that as well, uh, or some of the other thing, points that were touched upon a little earlier. You mentioned, a couple of people mentioned different genocides and the, and the um, impact that it's had on the students, their approach. James, you've talked about it, for example, uh, when they come to the class. So I guess the question that I would ask then is what, in light of that, in, light, in terms of your teaching, how do you keep the Shoah as, let's say, the, the unprecedented, the paradigmatic genocide, the term that Professor Bauer uses and that we've heard many times, how do you approach that? How do you approach teaching the Shoah in the context of all the other genocides that, you know, again, as, as, as Yudha Bauer said, keep happening over and over again? Um, do you separate, do you link? Where do you draw comparisons? Where does it stand separate? Um, so I'm going to begin with Paula. Um, I'm actually going to sneak in and just talk about empathy for a minute because I think that it comes into, if you're going to be teaching the Holocaust as, as one of the, the many genocides, um, I think that you, sh you can't take, as educators, I don't think we can take empathy for granted because you, when you asked about who do you want them, the young people to, to draw empathy with, the perpetrators, the victims, whatever, I think it's a very difficult question because I, I think that our, our learners now are, are, are very used to seeing harsh images of people in, in, in terrible circumstances across the world, whether it be in Darfur or wherever. And I think that as a result, I suppose young people are kind of desensitized to it. So, you know, the most eager and motivated teacher of the Holocaust might feel passionate about it and might be quite, quite, I don't know, frustrated or even angry at, at, at their students who are not, who haven't got that empathy. And I think we have to you know, really work on our pedagogy and not take empathy 
for granted. And I actually agree with, I can't remember who said it, I apologize. When somebody was saying about the bystanders, I think we need to give a lot of empathy to the bystanders because I think these are the, probably the group of people, the largest group of people our learners would, are likely to be. And um, so they have to understand the issues of who the bystanders are. And I know that many, many Jewish people um, are not very keen um, on, on Jews only being seen as victims, so they wouldn't you know, necessarily be that, be that grateful for, for young people across the world, you not know, just learning about empathy, giving them to, to Jewish people alone. That doesn't do us any good either. Um, answering your question about genocides, Mark, I, I've not got a lot to say about that. I just want to say one, one point. And that is, I don't think, I think it's, it's demeaning and trivial to put all the genocides together. I think each genocide is unique and particular. And as educators, we have to give each of these genocides the respect they deserve. Yes, you may want to single out the Holocaust, the Holocaust as being unprecedented and the largest. That's completely up to you. But I think that you know, putting them, grading them according to a league table is not the way to go. And empathy is something we have to really work on. Ian? Uh, can I go back to the bystander question for a second, Whatever Mark? Whatever question is that you okay? want to go back to. <laughs> um, challenge with the bystander part is when students, or adults for that matter, see themselves as falling into the bystander category, it's difficult to get out of that. How do you get out of being the bystander, um, particularly if you're not in the circumstance right at that moment? Um, I hope that we wouldn't see ourselves as, as the perpetrator and the victim, but when kids see themselves falling in that sort of powerless role of being a bystander, because this has happened now, you've given me all this information, I feel terrible about it, but what can I do about it? Now I can't do anything about it now. And I think that there's something that's powerful for kids when they can see that the knowledge that they have, that they can transmit to other people or they can change their own behavior, that can take them out of being the bystander. I'll give you a really quick example. Uh, I was fortunate to have kids in, in Auschwitz a number of times in the last three or four years, but one time, uh, and I share this because I shared it with the panel yesterday and they said that it would be good to try to get this in. We're in a situation where we had come back from Auschwitz, it was late at night, uh, back in the hotel, too late to debrief. The next day we had been in Krakow, so the evening of the day after, we are now in the hotel room, we've had dinner, 41 students, eight staff, so I'm thinking now is the time for us to be able to debrief and talk about this. So I had the kids go in their teacher groups and they're each talking with their teacher about their first impression, worst impression, the image they can't get out of their mind, various things like that. And I'm presuming that there's no one else in the room except my students. And as the kids are talking, I see an elderly gentleman get up from behind a pillar and start to walk toward me, and he's obviously agitated. And I'm thinking, oh no, don't let this be bad. He's gonna tell me it wasn't all like that, or they made them do it, or I'm getting ready for a really difficult conversation as this man approaches me. He gets about from me to Mark away, puts his hands out and breaks down in tears, and, and gives me like a full-on bear hug. And he said, um, my name is Bernard Lund. And when I was the age of these students, I was arrested by the Gestapo for giving out anti-Nazi pamphlets in my high school. And I was arrested. I never saw my family after that day. I was taken to Sachsenhausen. I was moved from Sachsenhausen to Auschwitz. I obviously survived. And I've come back here for the first time with my wife. Bernard would have been 75 years old. The first time I've come back. And he said, what you're doing with these students is so critically important because one day someone will say, this never happened. But they're here. They've touched the wire. They've walked the path. Now they can take that away with them. And it took the kids out of being the bystander because they could now be part of the story. Certainly not part of the story in that they were the narrative in 1942, but they met Bernard. They were in that place and they could take themselves out of being in the role of the bystander. It's a very powerful thing. 
it's a big challenge. How many kids can we take to Auschwitz I'm, or wherever? But it's an important point, I think. I think Ian uh, makes a very important point how we have a responsibility to also leave our students with something uplifting and inspiring. We walked through the Avenue of the Righteous here at Yad Vashem, and while there weren't enough rescuers and people with carriage, they, no matter what age group we're working with, adults included, we have to also include the stories of a Jean Karski or a Gertrude Luckner um, uh, or a Korshak or or, or even the Bielski uh, was a partisan. We have to inspire these brave stories and leave them with that also. We're going to open up to questions that are just uh, your questions in just a couple of minutes. I want to follow up though, uh, based on what Marcy just said, which is a question uh, that I wanted to go to anyway, is the widening. In other words, we now teach the, the Shoah to multi ethnic groups, multi uh, you know, pluralistic societies. We don't have just one narrative. We don't have one hegemony. Uh, you know, uh, 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 respective only dealing with it. So how do we reach? And Marcy, you just sort of hinted at one way, but how do we reach this variety of students? How do we teach them about this when they're all coming from different perspectives and different backgrounds and their own narratives, their own interests, their own concerns? Well, James. Uh, well, I I think uh, that. Uh, witness uh, testimony is is absolutely essential uh, because and, and to integrate it all along the way for every uh, period that you're covering every aspect of the Holocaust that you're covering because there's something about um, the immediacy of sitting in a room and even though um, it's a video hearing an actual uh, survivor talk about the experience I, I have found uh, in the teaching of my course that the uh, video of the Yad Vashem interview with Ruth Brand, um, who I actually heard when I took the international seminar, that that is always the high point, well, it's hard to say high point, but that, that's always the most important moment in the course. There's something about that woman and the way she tells her story, and maybe because it's so comprehensive, it, it begins with her childhood life all the way through her uh, liberation from Auschwitz. She's so sincere, so uh, direct, so uh, clear about what happened to her. It, it's incredibly moving. So th that's one that they see in their entirety, but all throughout the course they see a witness testimony, and I think that's, I can't even imagine teaching the class without a witness testimony. Just before we came in, I, I encountered a woman from Greece. I don't know if she's still in the audience or not. And um, I, I had a, a woman visit our, our uh, senior seminar at the college, the undergraduates, whose family lived on an island at, uh, called Thakensos, where the bishop, and the mayor were asked to present the names of all the Jews on that island to the Nazis. And the bishop refused. He put his name down. And the mayor refused and put his name on the list. And every single Jew on that island survived. So I mean, there are stories that can be uplifting. There aren't enough, but, but there are wonderful stories. Wow, that's great. Is, is your question about multicultural or about Muslim? Learners. I'm having the I wasn't trouble. sure what your question, I didn't hear it. Was it about multicultural in society right, and with teaching, Muslim learners? Right, exactly. Is that what you would like to? I'll say a couple of words about that. Um, I think um, um, I would like to sort of say a big sweeping generalism, which is purely anecdotal and hasn't got backup research at the moment because there isn't a lot of research done in this. Um, certainly in, in the UK uh, context, Geoffrey Short is one of the, the researchers who has had a lot of published work done in teaching the Holocaust in a multicultural classroom, particularly with Muslim students. Um, in the UK context, we have uh, many Muslim mu students um, are participants in the Lessons from Auschwitz project. Um, I know that um, uh, some of them in Scotland, I think one of them was actually chosen to address the Scottish Parliament um, relatively recently. I know that um, in the Holocaust, as far as the, the commemoration of Holocaust Memorial Day is concerned in the United Kingdom, um, there, it has been boycotted by the MCB until this very year, 2012, 
when they, had, they, they participated in the commemorative event. So I think that you know, there, are, there are some changes, there are things happening, which, you, which certainly I wouldn't make an assumption that teaching the Holocaust and multicultural uh, to Muslim pupils in, in, in the United Kingdom context is necessarily problematic. Okay? I think that, that's very, very important. That may not be true of Muslim students in France or in other communities, and I look forward to the questions afterwards. Okay? Um, what I would say is that, having said that, there are going to be some Muslim students who have their own historical narrative, use, use of a better term, who have their own historical narrative and who see the events of the Holocaust quite differently and the importance of the Holocaust quite differently. Um, and they may or may not come into the classroom and listen and engage. Now we all know as teachers, educators, how difficult it is to engage with students who do not wish to engage. Okay? So we need to get some strategies going. I know that Geoffrey Short's strategies include making it relevant to, to, the, to the Muslim learners by discussing um, the Muslim righteous amongst the nations, in particular contribution of Muslims to, to um, saving uh, Jews in, I think it was Tunisia. Um, and indeed, um, talking about Islamophobia, because it's, there's another prejudice, they're taking at it from their perspective. But, <laughs> also being balanced um, and also explaining the role of the Mufti of Jerusalem and his pro-Nazi in, um, uh, influence and, 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 act and activities in forming the SS Hansar unit. I mean, you have to put things in perspective here. But that makes it relevant to them. It might not suit their aspects of their political historical narrative, but it gives some relevance to them. But there is a but. And that but is what happens if you are teaching Muslim students who are coming in who don't want to engage, who don't want to listen, and you know as a teacher that their parents will support them. That's a problem. I don't have an answer for it. Maybe you do. We need more research. Right, I'm going to go to my last question, which is really a follow-up directly, Paula led into it, um, which is in some ways perhaps the, the, the most political question of all. Um, Based on that, based on the last couple of days, we've heard a number of speakers talk about the difficulties in the, on the, in the academ in academia and so on of teaching about the Holocaust related to Israel, Middle East. Um, so my question is going to be, basically, is first of all, do you find that there's a linkage of the two, of teaching about the Holocaust and Middle East and, and flatly pro-Israel, pro-Zionist position? Is it under criticism because of that? Have you run into difficulties? Is this an issue that you are confronting? We've heard a lot of people talking about it from a more um, you know, highly academic perspective, not necessarily direct practical experience perspective. And I'm curious where you see this playing out, if at all it has an impact, and how do you deal with it if it does? So um, maybe we'll begin, Ian, we'll begin with you. And this will be, I'm sorry, this will be the last question. After this, we're gonna open it up for your questions. Uh, so my response to this deals more with, um, remember I'm talking about a high school situation now where um, things are significantly different than at the university and postgraduate level. But I'll give a great example of how I think this plays out. Students in uh, the Ontario curriculum are required to do a summative at the end of the course as well as an examination. So in a grade 12 course in my school, I sat in and listened to summatives in a living cultures course. So the first summative given by a young Jewish woman named Jessica. Jessica talks about being on the march of the living. In the process of doing her presentation in the summative, she breaks down and starts to cry because her great aunt was in one of the death camps. She's continues, composes herself, and continues and finishes her summative. The rest of the students in the class are sort of thunderstruck. The next person doing a summative is a young woman wearing a hijab named Amira. Amira talks about the situation that happened, and this took place maybe two and a half years ago, when there was considerable conflict between um, Israeli military and the uh, incursion into Gaza and what happened there. Uh, and so Amira is talking about what happens, her Palestinian point of view, and she breaks down partway through her presentation 
because she has an aunt in Gaza that they haven't heard from in about three weeks. So they don't know if the aunt is well or injured, there's no communication. And so Amira breaks down, then she composes herself. So the class ends. Whew. Okay, off to math, everybody, right? You know, I mean, incredibly powerful moment. And so I thought, I can't just let this be. I have to find these young women someplace later in the day. So I do that. I find Jess. I get her to come down to the office. I say to her, Jess, that was so powerful today. I felt I was so moved by you and what you had to say um, and, and your great aunt. And her first thing she said, I felt so bad for Amira. How could she be like that? She doesn't even know what's happened to her family. I felt so terrible for her. I find Amira. You can guess the story. I find Amira. I say to Amira, are you okay? That was so hard for you to explain what happened. First thing she said, I feel so bad for Jess. How could they do that to people? How could they put them in gas chambers just because of what they believe? And I said to my teacher afterward, I said, Dave, if we do nothing more than this, we've done something. Because the only way, in my view, that that question is going to be answered, Mark, is when Jess sees Amira as Amira, not as a Palestinian, and when Amira sees Jess as Jess and not as a Jew. When the labels are gone, when they see one another as individuals, as 17, 18 year old young women in my high school who are going through that kind of pain and that kind of introspection, and they can, com they can help one another to do that. I think that's the answer. Certainly at the level that I work with kids, that's the only answer for me. Christian? Mm. Okay. Um, one Paula, point. quickly, Just one very and we're going to give Marcy. James, do you have anything to add on this? No, we should take questions. Okay, so Paula and then Marcy will have the last well, word. I, I mean, and obviously, who's, who, who's going to contradict his wonder, you know, that wonderful idealistic vision? Nobody can <laughs> contradict that, for goodness sake. We all want peace and we all want that for our children and the next generation. Um, I'm afraid I don't, I'm not quite as, as optimistic. I, I, I would say with regarding um, the Middle East situation with tensions in the Middle East, I, I, I tend to teach the Holocaust, I like to keep it divorced of it. I don't like to mix the two because I just don't think it helps. I think it, I think it, it, it distorts the situation and all sorts of political views take over, which if we're talking about the core, <laughs> the core gets lost. So I, I certainly don't, don't encourage that. I just want to just make one, one, one comment though, which is a little comment in Scotland. I think it was 2011, but I may be, my year may be out. Um, in Scotland, for a Holocaust, one, in Holocaust Memorial Day in Scotland, it's, it's been very, very successful in that it, every, every year there's an increasing number of, of school and community events to learn about the Holocaust and to commemorate it. And um, in 2010 or 11, you can Google me and find out what I'm talking about. There was one incident, uh, not one incident, one event which they wanted to, this organization wanted to put on the Holocaust Memorial Day website, which uh, was not, which was taken down. And that was an event by the Scottish branch of the Palestinian Solidarity Campaign, who had invited a Palestinian speaker to speak um, under, for Holocaust Memorial Day in Edinburgh. And this speaker, was somebody who um, was in support of the terrorist uh, bombings um, in, in Israel. And um, we thought that was totally, the, the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust thought that was totally inappropriate and they took it off their site. But I just want to say that that's what can happen, is that people can, can use um, the Holocaust to, you know, for, for their, own, their own agendas, be it political or whatever. And it's something that I think we do have to the lights have gone out. And they it's something that we do have to respond to and respond to quite vigorously. And Marcy, last word from well, us. I created a, a new course on America and the Holocaust in the graduate program. And we look at the role, you know, it's a process. Nothing happens in a vacuum. And the students want to know, I mean, they never heard of the Balfour Declaration. They never heard of the McDonald white paper and the effect that that had. Many of them think, why didn't all of the Jews in Europe just go to Palestine? They don't understand the restraints, the politics involved with the British. And so it's important for them to understand this background.
So, so that is, is one issue. We don't have a lot of uh, problem with the students who come in. They're very open-minded. Students who voluntarily sign up to become graduate students are very open. But if you understand the Holocaust, you understand, you understand automatically um, how important it is for the state of Israel to be strong and to survive. And um, everyone aches in their heart for anyone who's suffering, any, whether they're Arab, Muslim, Christian, or Jew. And this is the real, uh, it makes a strong case. We had a, a think tank, a very wonderful opportunity a few years ago from our scholars conference because Elie Wiesel was also one of the founding directors. We had an all day think tank and what he really implored upon us to do, he said for, it was for 42 years now we've been in existence, he said you have really created Jewish Christian dialogue and now it is time to create trialogue with moderate Muslims. And it is that dialogue that we begin to, have to begin to really cultivate and think about in our communities. It's not gonna be an easy task. It wasn't that easy a task in 1970 when Hubert Locke and Franklin Littell brought the Jewish scholars who were working over here and the Christian scholars who were working over there, when he, they brought them together for the first time. And so it can be done and it's not going to be easy, but this is a, one of our responsibilities in our communities. Jewish Christian Muslim dialogue really has to be serious. We can't wait until something terrible breaks out in individual communities around the world. If the dialogue is ongoing and we begin to understand each other, we may have a chance of all surviving. I'm going to um, stand up so I could see if, uh, people who want to ask. This is the moment I hope that people have been waiting for for a few days, a chance to ask questions of a real live panel. Um, we should have a microphone around, and the only thing I would ask is that if you could make a question and a brief question, if you could say who you're addressing it to, whether it can be addressed to the panel in general, but um, if I've asked my friend Tom to do this, thanks. Um, or if there's someone by name that you would like to address. So now it's, it's your hands, and if anybody would like to start with the first question, just there in the back there. Um, there are two, gentlemen, and then the lady after that. And I guess maybe if you just identify who you are and where you're from as well. While we're waiting for the technical assistance, there's one other thing I'd like to add. One thing I have found in various communities, sometimes people hold a double standard for Israel. And I think that's something that we should be aware of, that they think Israel should be the perfect model of democracy. Um, do, you know, do you want to come up front and just ask your question, then we'll repeat it to the, or this may work after all. Thank you. This is addressed to the whole panel. <clears throat> My name is Ezra Stieglitz, and I'm a professor at Rhode Island College in Providence, Rhode Island, USA. And uh, I teach a course on Holocaust and other genocides. And lucky it's a four-credit course, means I meet my students four times a week, four hours a week, I mean. And my question is, in teaching a course such as this, how much of the course should be devoted to the Holocaust, and how much of the course should be devoted to the teaching of other genocides? Because I strongly feel that the Holocaust should serve as a foundation, and, and then segue into other genocides and patterns and so on and so forth. How do you feel about that? Okay. Does anyone, James, you yeah. want to start? Um, actually, the course that I teach in the Holocaust is called The Shoah and Modern Genocide, but it's 95% the Holocaust, and the modern genocide part is that uh, the students have to do a final project that they begin in the middle of the semester uh, working in a pairs where they uh, have to make a presentation on one of the other major uh, genocides. And I give them a protocol of questions and issues that they must address in the presentation. And at the top of the list is how is this particular genocide similar to and how is it different from the Shoah because all along the Shoah has been presented as the paradigmatic one. So 
um, we really only spend um, less than a week on the other genocides, but the students are thinking about this from mid-semester on in relation to whatever one Maybe. they've decided to do. That's good. Anybody else want to answer that I very briefly? Very briefly. I think it's a personal choice, really. I, I, I mean, what, what, what I would say is that if you were doing Holocaust and, and other genocides, I think if you were doing the Holocaust, it sounds from the title, you're going to do the Holocaust first. <laughs> yes? <laughs> okay. And you would use the learning that you have learned from the Holocaust to apply it to other genocides and your own understanding of other genocides. I think that's, you know, it's up to you as to what proportion. The only thing I'd say as educators is that some of you may be involved in other modules where it's, I don't know, Holocaust and human rights, or the Holocaust and citizenship studies. And it kind of worries me sometimes that, you know, you, some people might be using the other bit, either the combination bit of the second bit of the combination or the first bit of the combination in a, in a very tokenistic fashion. So I'd like to, well, I'm going to do a module on, on Holocaust and human rights. When you're really teaching human rights, but you, but you want to just, you know, sort of touch on the Holocaust. And so, you know, you're just, it becomes a ticky box exercise, if you like, not really getting to grips with what you're suggesting, which is learning from the Holocaust and using that to subsequent another, another area. Okay. Uh, there was someone waiting for the next question. I think. Hi, my name's uh, Jennifer. I'm a PhD student at the University of Waterloo. And my question is to do with the fact that uh, I've observed at several universities that most people teach either the Holocaust or Nazism, and that that's a real problem because some people who study the Holocaust have no knowledge of Nazism. For example, in a class, someone once asked at a graduate level who Goebbels was. They didn't know who the master of propaganda was because they'd never actually studied Nazism. We can't Sorry. hear you. Right. Yeah, it's really hard. Um, in, a, in, many grad, in many classes at universities, you either studied the Holocaust or Nazism, not both. And I've had experiences at the graduate level where people studying the Holocaust have no knowledge of the German history. For example, uh, I had a student ask who Goebbels was. They didn't know who they were. Um, and they were a graduate student. They were completing their master's thesis which to me is problematic because when you don't study the Nazi period, you have no framework or contextualization for where the Holocaust is. And my question is, how do you address that? Because the Holocaust is in itself such a large topic. How do you make time, if you have a semester or even a year, to cover both Nazism and the Holocaust in such a way that provides students a good understanding? Is that addressed to anyone specifically or the panel in general? It's more universal. Okay. Anyone want to? Uh deal with that? Well, it's a problem in, in universities. The, the historians want to talk about their piece of history. The political scientists want to make it uh, a political science issue, science issue. The psychologists want to talk about the psychology of genocide. And, uh, and, and that's why we need to bring everyone together, all the, in, all the disciplines talking to each other. Christian, you alluded a little bit to something like that in one of your comments earlier in, in, in Germany. How do you deal with that? I'm not quite sure if... I'm not, I'm not quite sure... It's working. I'm not quite sure if I understood the question right. Uh, is the question that uh, you have, on the one hand side, you have teaching about the Holocaust, on the other side, you have to teach about the political structure of national socialism. In my eyes, in my experience, it has to, be to, come, it has to come together. Uh, it is not possible to talk about the Holocaust if you do not know, to do no, know nothing about the, the propaganda, if you do not no, know nothing about the Weimar Republic, if you do not know about a, a, lots of other things um, until the Second World War. There would not have been a Holocaust about the Second World War. Therefore, as an historian, uh, it has to be put together and it, had be, it has to be discussed, which is the interdependence between both of them. James, you had something, I thought? Well, uh, yeah, I, I, one of uh, my colleagues, I don't remember who uh, mentioned this before, but I really feel that to do justice to the issue, it has to be a truly interdisciplinary uh, approach and that you can't decouple um, Nazism from the Holocaust. It's, it's, it's inconceivable. There has to be some awareness, some study, some knowledge of um, the history of, of not just anti-Semitism, but German anti-Semitism. There has to be some awareness of the 
Weimar Republic and Nazi ideology and uh, the way Nazi propaganda utilized Nazi racial ideology. Uh, I, I, I can't conceive of talking about Nazism apart from uh, anti-Semitism. They just have to go hand in hand. Marcy, and, and that's why we created this MA program at Stockton that is totally interdisciplinary. And we bring in a visiting scholar every year, a new scholar. One year we've had a psychologist, Dan Barone, the late Dan Barone, and we brought you to Habauer. We, we bring in people from all disciplines, and our faculty are borrowed from all of the disciplines around the college. Because it, and the degree, it stands alone. It's an MA degree in Holocaust studies, and there are not many. Sometimes the, the, the administrators like things that are neat, so they want to put it in Jewish studies, or maybe sometimes in history, but it really needs to stand alone as a discrete discipline, interdisciplinary discipline. Okay. Uh, anybody else with questions? Were there? Um, can I? Okay. Uh, Evi Manopoulou from Greece, uh, secondary education, so I'd like to address uh, one question and one remark. <laughs> uh, the question is mostly for the colleagues from the secondary education, uh, whether you uh, consider um, uh, that uh, there is a need for a, a legislative and administrative frame uh, in the education so that uh, Holocaust education can work better. Uh, th there are so many things in the air and uh, uh, educators cannot do many things in this frame, the present frame. Second, uh, there has been so much uh, hate speech accumulated recent years. Uh, is now a Holocaust education uh, alone adequate to confront the problem because uh, old monst monsters is again in our courtyards nowadays. Um, I don't know whether we, we, we have to find more uh, ways and strategies to respond to that. Uh, I mean about a, a total uh, orientation of the education towards values and principles that uh, are set aside. Um, and this hate speech becomes uh, mainstream and uh, is all over uh, in politics and education too. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Ian? I, I can respond to the first part if I understand the question correctly, whether the, the Holocaust education should be legislated, is that, that what I'm understanding? Or mandated, maybe, mandated. just as well. I think absolutely it should. Um, the people that attend all these programs do so by choice. The students that my colleagues have chose to be in those courses. I presume, James, the kids get to choose to be in your course. In a public education system, if there is nothing mandated by the jurisdiction that runs that system, then the pressure on covering the curriculum is so great that the things that don't have to be there won't be there. And my teachers will defer to the stuff that has to be there and cover the other things if there's time. And there will never be time because they always tell me there isn't even time to do the things that they have to do. They'll never get to the things that they'd like to do. So I think it's a great idea. I love it in Ontario, where I'm a principal, because in uh, second year of high school, history is mandated. The course is prescribed by the Ministry of Education. Second World War is on that course. Holocaust is in that unit. The one part that where there's some fluctuation, I've mentioned it earlier, is the teacher can opt as to whether or not he or she uses two hours or two days, but they still have to cover that part. If that wasn't there, it wouldn't happen. Okay, and the second question dealt with the impact of hate speech. Um, how to deal with it. Does anyone want to try to touch upon that at all? Um, um, just very, very brief, briefly. 
because we actually had an incident, um, a local and isolated incident in, in Scotland, which is um, under um, investigation at the moment, in that uh, there was something on a Facebook site. Um, and uh, it was um, basically, it had, uh, the name of it was something like, please don't quote me on this, but it was something like, um, we are something in, in, in Israel or being Jewish. On, on, you, you think you're in Israel, Dash. Um, only Jewish is Gifnock, and Gifnock is the area in Scotland where there is the, the, the synagogue um, in Glasgow, where there is the, the, the Jewish deli, deli delicatessen, and where most of the majority of Jewish people live. And basically, there was some very offensive and anti-Semitic remarks made on that Facebook site, and um, sadly, <laughs> Sadly, the profile page of this site had the, the picture of the most well-known um, Jewish survivor who came to Scotland, who is who's now, um, um, may he rest in peace, uh, called Ernest Levy. That, that was the profile page. So this was people who knew something about the Holocaust and who were using it in a very divisive way. Um, so in answering your question, what can be done? <laughs> um, I, for the record, that Facebook site was off within 48 hours and people had taken pictures of it as evidence and gave it to the police and it is under investigation, okay? What can be done, I think, is we as educators have to factor in um, something about teaching young people, not children, because they're children and young people, um, how to address um, hate literature on the internet. They ought to know, by the, if they can click a button, and do all sorts of damage. They ought to know the procedures inside out as to what to do to get it off. And, and I really do think that's something that every single teacher, whether they're teaching the Holocaust or not, actually, um, should be very, very vigilant about that with, with young people um, just now. I'm going to exercise a moderator's um, privilege and, and actually answer a question because that's an issue that I've dealt with a lot in my own work, in my own writings, and just very narrowly and very quickly, I'll just say that the technology that has been sold to educators as making your life easier and making education better actually, in reality, makes your life much more difficult and makes your task much more difficult. And without getting into tremendous detail, I would say that you can't take for granted that any student at any level has the critical skills to evaluate websites, social media, and so on. That's where they get the bulk of their information from today. It's the first place they turn. And one of the tasks, especially in this subject, in dealing with it, is either to teach how to critically evaluate the material or to only give them, uh, allow use of certain uh, sites and posts that you yourself have evaluated in the past. Um, but this is a life skill. As they go on and use the internet and social media for for dating, for taking out loans, for buying cars, for applying to schools and jobs, etc. They need to know the skill above and beyond the subject matter of the Holocaust. But in this area specifically, you cannot take anything for granted. And I think that would be the basic starting place that I would say with that. So then I'll be quiet now. Um, any other questions that we have, please? Um, is this working? Can you hear me? I'm, I'm Christina Whitelaw Jaffe. I'm Scottish like Paula. But my teaching experience has been in Germany for 38 years. And my question is specifically to Christian. If you agree with me that one of the biggest obstacles in, one of the biggest obstacles in German education of the Holocaust is the fact that the students, pupils, and their uh, parents, and mostly the teachers, share one problem. There is no real family tradition in dealing with the Holocaust. And this manifests itself in the fact that when there are meaningful contacts between Holocaust survivors and the German students, one of the first questions is often, what did your grandfather do? And the child uh, and the teacher, well-meaning though they are, usually says, I don't know. And the result is then not a very good contact between these two people. Another point in connection with this, I'd like, I think, I'd like to know if you agree with me, is that 
German educators transmit a very heavy feeling of guilt to the students. And I've no solution to this, but I think it's a fact that we have to recognize this hasn't been so. I, I can only talk about one personal experience. I went to the school from Munich to Berlin and we were at the memorial site in, in, uh, for the murdered Jews. And we had a discussion there. Uh, two participants were Jewish and the other ones were the rest. And I can remember, and this was the only occasion I, in my personal six years teaching, can remember, I think I had never such an intensive talk about history compared to this talk from the, well, the grand uh, Uenke, um, and the others who had no real feeling for that, who always uh, were, were confrontated the, the Jewish item in that class, but they had never really talked about it. They had never talked about the family tradition in the Jewish uh, con context and in the German context and in the Arabic context and in all the other contexts which were uh, there. And I really say it is a problem, but I have no solution for, losing, for, for sol solving that problem. That is... Yeah. Are there any other questions? Uh, yes, please. Hi, my name is Judith and I live in Alexandria, Egypt, and I work in a private school, which is irrelevant to my question. Uh, and my question may be more scholarly than anything else, and I apologize if it sounds a little circuitous. Somebody mentioned the fact that the Shoah did not happen that long ago. The history is not, it's not like 2,000 years ago. But the Armenian genocide is almost 100 years old, and the amount of information and the amount of education specifically on that older genocide doesn't seem to be out there very much. At least in the United States, I don't. But my point is a word that I consider very offensive, and that is real politic. When I learned that word, I went ballistic. And my question is, the students, however short amount of time they learn about the Holocaust, perhaps change their feelings, see the world differently, I'm looking in the future in terms of how can we assess the success of the Holocaust um, programs in high school or in college in terms of what students are willing to do with their own governments. For instance, the United States dealing with Turkey about admitting Armenia. Obama has, as far as I know, not called them on it yet. Um, there's a lot of political issues that go on around the, the world and people get stuck. So in terms of citizenship for the future, you know, how can we make that connection between the Holocaust, what they're learning now, and 10 or 15 years later, when they might be voting and or not wanting to be bystanders, feel that they can do something besides say, gee, that's just too bad. Yeah. Um, I'd like to respond to that, and also it sort of picks up on something um, that was said earlier. Uh, I, I, don't, uh, I don't think bystanders are powerless. I, I think bystanders have a great deal of power and, and they make a moral choice to either exercise that power or not to exercise it. Um, and I, I think one of the important aspects of Holocaust education, and this is part of the context uh, and emphasizing the context, is uh, to remind the students that um, the Nazis used the democratic system to come to power. That was a democratically elected government. Um, and that even in a democracy, people have to be vigilant um, and they have to recognize that they do have power uh, and that they can make moral choices. I think that's one of the important features of Holocaust uh, education. Um, by Someone said that, you know, in, in, I don't remember who, but someone said, when it comes right down to it, during the Shoah, there were really only two options. You could either be a hero or a coward, and people made moral choices. People didn't just sort of wander into bystanderhood. Um, they chose to be bystanders for a 
very complex reasons. And I think Browning's Ordinary Men really uh, shows that. But nonetheless, when it comes right down to it, people decided to be perpetrators and other people decided to be bystanders. And that's what citizenship is all about. Okay. Um, are there any other questions? If not, I want to thank our panel members for could the we, conversation. Can we make a final statement? I think we can. Okay. Um, and I want to thank you all for your attention. Um, we hope this has been useful. Participating and, and sticking out with us. And the last